The Bible teaches that you are a body. But the Bible teaches also that you are a living soul. And the Bible teaches that your body is temporary. Your body is going to go to the grave. But your soul is going to live forever and ever. Jesus said if you gained all the pleasure and all the wisdom and all the riches in the whole world and lost your soul, you would have made a poor bargain. I'm Jeff Forster. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we are talking about the end game. And uh, over this next couple weeks, this week and two more, we're going to talk about eternity. We're going to talk about heaven and hell. And uh, I, th- I think it's kind of funny. Pastor Chris said, uh, so we're talking about eternity and heaven and hell. In the first service, they were a little sleepy, had a hard time paying attention. But then Chris mentions peeps are the worst candy. Everybody's like, yes, peeps are the worst. <laughs> so hopefully... You guys will dial in on the message today. I thought it was cool hearing Billy Graham's voice, maybe the greatest influencer for Jesus in the previous generation, talking about preparing for eternity. And uh, it's just a great reminder today. So we're talking about this idea of preparing for your end game. And if you're wondering, it, there's some notes in your program. You can fill in a few blanks, track along. But I put the definition of end game because several people didn't know what we were talking about. So the idea of an end game comes from chess. Merriam-Webster says it's the final stages of a chess match after most of the pieces have been removed from the board. Or the secondary definition is just the final stage of some action or process. And so what we're talking about is planning. Planning for our final moves. The, the whole game is about setting up a strong end game. That's what you're doing. So some, uh, I don't know, how many of you were chess players or are chess players? You like chess? There's a few of you? Yeah. Uh, most of us, we claim we like chess, whether we're good at it or not, just to look smart. So it, how many of you are good at chess? Raise your hand. Yeah, you all are now. Everybody raise their hand. <coughs> uh, I loved chess. I loved it as a kid, and uh, I was that nerd that played it at lunch. And um, I just bought a chess set in uh, Morocco a while back, handmade. It's just really cool. It's in my office. I, I love chess. And this idea, for some of you, depending on what strategy, strategies are, some, your end game is very quick. You're moving very, very quickly towards that. Others, um, you know, you're up against a strong opponent, and they've got some good counter moves, and so the whole game is setting up so that you have the right pieces on the board at the right time so that you can begin to implement your end game and close the game out and win. And one of the things about the end game is that it's not predetermined always at the beginning. Maybe you had a rough start. Maybe uh, the opponent put up some uh, uh, obstacles that made it difficult for you to overcome, and so you had to readjust your plan. Maybe you just had a faulty plan to start with, but uh, as, you begin to, as the game begins to move into the end game, you use the pieces that you have, and it, it's not too late. Um, many, many times I've my whole plan got destroyed, and yet sitting there at the end, I had, a, I had some, some strategic moves and was able to make them win the game. It's the same uh, in life, that your end game is not always determined by um, the beginning of the game. So this, it's not too late. Even better, though, it, it's good now to look ahead, to be intentional, to do what you can now for the rest of your life so you can finish strong later. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, well, it's still well known, but uh, Drake is, uh, uh, for those of you that, uh, all the 70-year-olds in the room that have Drake on your iPods, um, uh, or 8-track players, I don't know, but Drake, Drake's a hip-hop artist, a rapper from uh, uh, the mean streets of Toronto. I never figured out how that happened, but uh, uh, he's a rapper, and he had, a, a few, several years ago, was releasing a new record and uh, coined the YOLO idea, hashtag YOLO, you only live once, and uh, I seen a lot of people with that. I saw one girl, she had it tattooed, hashtag YOLO, on the inside of her ear right there. And I'm like, girl, that was a bad decision if you only live once right there, because that hurts. That's a, I saw one guy, because YOLO, uh, the whole idea of you only live once is kind of an excuse sometimes to make dumb decisions. Well, you only live once, right? Let's jump off the roof into the pool, right? That kind of thing. You only live once. So sometimes we use that you only live once as, a, as an excuse to make bad decisions. I saw one guy, he had YOLO tattooed on his four knuckles. You know that guy was planning on making bad decisions, right? So, uh, we're, so Drake did hashtag YOLO. We're doing hashtag YOLT. You only live twice. That's what we're talking about today. 
we're setting up this idea over the next few weeks, heaven and hell, eternity, what happens when you die. But it's just a reminder. That's all this, this message today is. We're kind of laying a foundation. Um, uh, it's a reminder that we need to get our perspective right. And when our perspective is right, our priorities adjust so that we live the most powerful life, make the biggest difference, and plan for eternity. Here's the problem, though. We all have a gravitational pull toward things that don't matter. We all do. All of us get in our relationships, with our money, with our time, with our attitudes, with our priorities. We, we just have a gravitational pull toward things that don't matter. You know, black holes uh, have some of the greatest gravitational pulls in the universe, but nothing of substance. It's easy to get focused on things that don't matter, like your March Madness bracket. Ugh, where did Texas Tech come from? I don't know, man. They messed me up. Things that don't matter, like Michigan basketball. I will say this. I'm a bra- <laughs> This is free. Hey, I, uh, you know what? I didn't even know that Green had a football team, but I always root for him in basketball. So... So I have, no, 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 you go in, go in the office and you look, we got brackets up on the wall. I picked Virginia and Michigan State for the final. So that's what I got. I think, I think Izzo is going to beat Coach K today. I think, please. But isn't it goofy though? How many of you have seen somebody yell at the TV in the last two weeks? Anybody? Have you seen somebody yell, at, scream at the TV? Have you seen grown men cry in the last two weeks? Any of you? How amazing is it that we put all our hopes and all of our emotions on the backs of 19-year-old men. How crazy is that, right? We do. There's this gravitational pull towards things that don't matter. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not wrong to enjoy life. God gave you all these things to enjoy. Uh, it's not wrong to have things or to enjoy things. It's, it's, it's bad for us when things begin to have us. And that's just a natural thing. It just We naturally get sucked into things that don't matter. So there's this old guy in the Bible. His name is Paul by this point. He's an old man. And he's writing to a young protege named Timothy. And uh, Paul writes and he says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. That means putting trust in themselves. Or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. But put your hope in God who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. So life is to be enjoyed, the things you have in life to be enjoyed. It's fun to complain and horse around about uh, March Madness, all that kind of stuff. But he said, listen, that's not where your hope is. That's not even where real satisfaction comes from. He says, put your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they'll lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Would you circle that? Coming age in your thing. He said there's a life after this life. What's coming next is more important than this. So that they will take hold of the life that is truly life. He's saying if you're not looking at the future, if you don't have an eternal perspective, if you're not looking at the coming life, then you're not living a life that's really the life you're supposed to live now. We're wasting it. We're wasting our, our, our efforts. We're wasting our time on things that just aren't going to last. Jesus is really clear on this. I, uh, we're going into this message series about heaven and hell and eternity. Next week we're talking about heaven. I, I'm gonna, I believe in heaven because Jesus did. I believe in hell because Jesus did. And Jesus was convinced as God in the flesh And Jesus came to convince us of the same thing, that we will spend the vast majority of our life on the other side. If you want to fill in the blanks, I'll spend the vast majority of my life on the other side. This life's only 70, 80, 90, 100 years. It's just dress rehearsal for eternity. Eternity, just by its definition, is long compared to 100 years. Here's what Solomon said about that. He said, God has planted eternity in the human heart. God made you knowing you're designed to live forever. God made you to desire not to die. God made you to be repulsed by death. When we stand at a casket, even somebody that we love, we cry, we pat their hand, we wish they weren't gone, we honor them for the life that they lived, but there's also this repulsion. It's just natural. We know that death was not for us, and it wasn't. God never meant for us to die. We'll talk about that later. But we do die. Aren't you glad he came to church on Sunday? Oh yeah. I just see the whole room just kind of like wilting. I just see you like slipping down in your seat. 
it's not us, shame on you, or it's a scary message or anything. But the reality is that this life is 100% terminal. None of us are going to get out of it alive. None of us. Everyone must die once, the book of Hebrews says. And after that, we'll be judged by God. Everyone must die once. After that, be judged by God. There, there's two judgments in the Bible. There's what's called the great white throne judgment. That's when all of humanity will stand before God and either you're in or you're out. That's it. It's the, it's the, it's the one that determines eternity. All right, do you spend eternity in heaven? Or do you spend eternity in hell? That's the judgment, the great white throne judgment. And that whole thing has nothing to do with works. It doesn't have anything to do with your behaviors. It doesn't have anything to do with your religion. It's based on, the book of Re- Revelation says, whether your name is found in the book of life. Ultimately, the question is asked, what did you do with Jesus? That's it. Did you receive Jesus or reject Jesus? That's that's the one. So then it's separated from there. And then for those that are believers, there's a second judgment, and it's called the judgment seat of Christ. And in this uh, instance now, uh, this judgment is more about like, uh, almost like an Olympic judge passing out the medals. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not judgment like, oh goodness, it's heaven or hell. And this one now, it's passing out the rewards. And, and, and here's what he says. Th- this one is for believers only. This one also does not have anything to do with heaven or hell. It has everything to do with what did you do with what God gave you? That's it. Well, what'd you do with the life God gave you? What'd you do with the resources God gave you? What'd you do with the, the relationships God gave you? What'd you do with your life? And God will reward us there. Here's what Paul says, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged, and we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil we've done in this earthly body. Jesus said it this way. He called himself the Son of Man. He said, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Would you circle the word reward? That reward there is uh, Jesus, I don't know if you knew this, Jesus didn't speak English. He understands you when you pray in English, but he didn't speak English. And so in this instance, he's using a Greek word, and the Greek word is apodidomai. Apodidomai just means, I'll pay you back. That's what it means. So you might just write circle reward, and then next one, I'll pay you back. That, that's what it means. Apodidomai means, I'll pay you back. Not like your brother-in-law, hey, can I borrow 100 bucks? I'll pay you back. It's not like that, right? Uh, Jesus really meant it. And... He pays back with interest. (laughs) I got personal right there. Somebody laughed over there when I said any any minute. He'll pay you back any minute. (laughs) Um, Sorry, ADHD. It's real. Squirrel. Yeah, that's right. The Bible also teaches that God pays back always. You'll never outgive God. God will never be in debt to you. Doesn't matter how many hard decisions you made or good decisions you made or all the good works you ever did, God will never be in debt to you. He'll always pay you back. And the Bible says that God pays you back with interest. You plant a seed and He gives a whole harvest back. That's what He says. So He'll pay you back with interest. You can never outgive God. He'll pay us back for every widow that we ever helped, <laughs> every soul we lead to Jesus. Hey, by the way, I just want to say thank you. Um, for those of you who gave, uh, at Christmas time to help us plant 100 churches. Remember that? We, we raised $30,000, plant 100 churches. Um, we launched the, our first initiative with this among the Pocot people in northwest Kenya. Uh, they're a group that we've been working with for a long time. We just got a note this last week that they've already launched over 50 churches since. I know! How cool is that? And they're carrying, they're, they're already carrying. Uh, uh, among those churches, among the, that group of people, they, they've had over 400 people trust Jesus, become followers of Jesus among those churches, and they're caring for almost 80 widows and orphans that were uncared for before, right? That, isn't that cool? I love that, yeah. So, good job. Don't give up, right? Well, you invest. You, you may never get to meet those people. You should come to Africa with us sometime. That'd be great. But you might never meet those people till you get to heaven. And someday somebody's gonna walk up and say, because of your sacrifice... I'm here, right? That, that, that's amazing. So every widow that you've ever helped, every soul that you've ever led to Jesus, every child that you've ever served, every teenager that you've ever pointed to Jesus, Jesus is saying, I'll pay you back, epididomai. Every dime that you've ever given, every time that you've ever been mocked or suffered for your faith, every martyr who ever gives their life 
for the gospel. This year, they're estimating more than 100,000 people will lose their lives around the world just because they're Christians. And Jesus says, I'll pay you back with interest. Every time you helped another person, every time you went out of your way or were inconvenienced for someone else, every time you chose the right way, the moral way, the Bible way, instead of just the easy way or the popular way, Jesus says, Apodidami, I'll pay you back. And that's what he's saying. So when that second judgment's not a bad judgment, that second judgment is all those things that you feel like you just left out there, the good that you did, and nobody noticed and nobody cared, he's like, I'm going to pay you back, and I'm going to pay you back with interest. So Jesus says in the, uh, the, sometimes people are nervous. So you talk about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is at the back of the Bible, the back of the book. And I tell you this all the time. I read the back of the book. Jesus wins. You don't have to worry about it at all. He's the winner. uh, Revelation chapter 22, one of the last things Jesus tells us, he says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I'll give to each person according to what they've done. So it's interesting. He's talking about the very end of time. So he's talking about the end of time. I'm bringing my reward with me. But he says, it's coming soon. So in the scope of eternity, in the scope of time, this life and the little bit left is not very long. So he says, I'm bringing my reward with me, and I'm going to give to everybody according to what they've done. So I want to talk about four thoughts for living for the end game. Four thoughts for living out your end game. Four big ones. First one is this. I'm just passing through. I'm just passing through. For some people, this is frustrating when I talk about it. I've had people before say, I don't like it when you talk about that. Um, uh, This is just temporary. This is a temporary assignment. This place is not home. Now, don't get me wrong. I love this place. I love being out in the desert. I love being out in the mountains. I love being out on the lake. I love, I love being in the woods. I love God's creation. I love everything that God made. I just, I love life. I love my family. I love being with people that God's given me in my life. But I have to remember, I'm just passing through. This isn't home. It's just a stopover on the way to the ultimate destination. For I've told you often before And I say it again with tears in my eyes that there are many whose conduct shows that they're really enemies of the cross of Christ. They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. He's not talking about food and their belly there. He's talking, they're just focused on getting and consuming, right? They're on that rat race just consuming as much as they can consume, getting as much as they can get. They brag about shameful things, always scooting around the edges, always shooting a move. And they think only about this life here on earth. They just have a temporary, you only live once worldview. And then he differentiates from those kind of people who are enemies of the cross that live with a you only live once attitude and and shooting moves and, and, and consuming everything they can get. And instead he says, but we're different. Those that are followers of Jesus are different. We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior, to come and rescue us. So our citizenship isn't here. Our citizenship is there. Our focus isn't here. Our focus is there. You know, this is really important that we contemplate where is our focus? Because in church on a Sunday morning, it's easy to go, oh, my focus is in eternity too. But let me ask you, I think there's a fair question. And I've, I've, I've challenged myself with this this week, and I got mad at myself two or three times that I was even asking it. So if you get mad at me, we're both mad at me. So here we go. Why am I so frustrated that I don't have more? I see other people who have stuff I don't have, and I want what they've got. And I'm not saying I'm, like, full of jealousy. I'm just aware of the fact that, dude, I'm, you know, I feel like there's more. Why aren't things nicer? Why am I frustrated that things aren't nicer? Why, why am I frustrated that life isn't easier? Why is it so frustrating that life is so short? When I start answering those questions, and I'm really honest with myself, I start realizing I struggle with having an internal perspective, too. I get caught up now, I get frustrated about now, like now is home. That doesn't make any sense. This isn't home. Uh, um, If you were on your, how many of you, if I said, let's all get a bus and move to Key West today, you're in. How many of you are in? We're moving to Key West, right? There's snow on the ground this morning. We we were down at the Fox last night, and uh, walking in, there's just a little drizzle. I got my umbrella from me and my wife, and we're walking up, and my daughter's got her own umbrella. We walk out, and you can't even see the rain send from the Fox because of just snowing so hard. I'm like, what in the world? Because I heard on the radio a couple days ago, welcome to spring. So anyways... That's my little rant for the morning. 
So we're all going to go to Key West, right? <laughs> but there's a bunch of us. We've got to get on a bus. We're going to take a road trip. It's going to take us, you know, a day and a half, two days to get down there. And, and if you're traveling to Key West, we don't care that the time spent at the rest stop in Paducah, Kentucky just wasn't more meaningful. I just didn't get as much out of it as I thought I was going to get out of it. It just didn't seem as exciting as I thought it was going to be. Right? It needed to be fancier. Why wasn't it fancier? You know, all we want to do is, you know, we're in a hurry to get to the beach, man. I'm not looking around going, gee, I wonder if they let me put up a shack over here in the corner. That's not it. That's not home. That's not even the destination. The rest area was necessary, if you know what I'm saying. It's necessary. It was functional, hopefully, but it didn't need to be a palace. There's no need to, need to put up new window treatments and repaint the stall and a little shiplap in the ladies' room. Right? Just take care of business, get back on the road, because this isn't the destination. And yet, we get obsessed about this. We, we, this is it. And, and we get so uptight about things that just don't matter. So that first point, if you're filling in the blanks, I'm just passing through. This isn't home. This isn't the destination. It's not the goal. As good as it is here, it's so much better there. Second one is my time on earth is short. I don't have much time. It's not very long here. Think about it. <clears throat> Eternity, life on earth. Max it out, 100, 105, 110. I think the oldest person on the planet right now is like 114, right? On the whole planet, 114. So at 114 versus eternity, eternity just by its own definition is, you know, long. A million years from now, that mullet you had in high school that made you look so cool just isn't going to matter at all. Right? Uh, the kind of car you had, how big your bank account was, you're not going to take any of it with you. Here's what James said. James was the brother of Jesus. He wrote a little short book at the end of the Bible. And he says, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. We don't. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. You know, if you had a little spray bottle, psst, the mist comes out and then disappears, psst. Mist comes out and disappears. My wife got a new puppy. I got a new puppy. Uh, and uh, uh, so we're training the puppy, and she's doing a good job for those of you who care. Um, so our, our first puppy, his name's Gucci. Our second puppy's name's Chanel. Uh, I didn't name them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so they, they're running around the house, and Gucci's aware, hey, wait a minute. You know, we, we open the door, and he's like, you know, he'll look at her little mess on the floor, and then he backs away like, it wasn't me, it was her, right? So we got some Febreze in the house right now. She's doing a lot better than the first days. But uh, we got some free Febreze in the house. You come in and it's psst, 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 and it, and it just disappears. You don't see it anymore. It just disappears. It's the same thing he said. That's the way your life is. In the scope of eternity, it's just a psst, and it disappears. Everybody you know is going to spend eternity somewhere. Everybody. It's going to spend eternity somewhere. This short little life and then eternity. Every little kid that's in the nursery, every teenager that's over in the middle school space, every mom, every dad here in the seats, every coworker, every classmate, every brother, every sister, every mom, every dad, every uncle, every aunt, every grandma, every grandpa, every friend, every enemy, every rich person, every poor person, everyone is going to spend eternity somewhere. This short little life at this little rest stop and then it's eternity at the destination. This life is short, barely, barely enough time to prepare for eternity, which is a long time. So, because of that, I should make the most of every opportunity, if you're filling in the blanks, I should make the most of every opportunity. This is now, you know, when, when I realize that this, this is a temporary assignment and that this life is short, it really begins to focus my priorities. What, what are the opportunities before me? Because I don't have very much time. How am I going to live my life? Here's what Paul says. He says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. He says, use your time wisely. Use your life wisely. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. 
And when he's talking about evil, that evil is not necessarily like sinful evil. Um, it's uh, dangerous. It's difficult. It's violent. It's, there's an end to it, right? That's what he's talking about when he's talking about that, that word there. <clears throat> so he's make the most of your time because it's short. That's what he's saying. Make the most of every opportunity because it doesn't last very long. Do you remember uh, how many of you were not alive on September 11th, 2001? How many of you were not alive on September? Okay, a couple of you. How many of you remember exactly where you were when you found out the planes crashed? Yeah. So uh, I was, um, uh, I had three little kids at home. My wife was a stay-at-home mom at the time. And uh, I had a meeting that day. And uh, so I got up, and I was getting around. I was just about ready to head out, and uh, I turned on the radio. I was gonna, just checking the weather, see how things were going to go that day. And um, uh, they mentioned that a plane had flown into uh, the World Trade Center. And I remember thinking, that doesn't seem right. That, how do you hit the World Trade Center? So I went downstairs. I turned on the, the television, and I'm standing there, and I called my wife because I was getting ready to leave in a meeting, and I'm trying to think what's going on. And my wife came down the stairs, and just as she stepped around the corner, the second plane live flies into the second building. And I'm thinking, this isn't good, right? Th that's not a mistake. That's on purpose. It's a terrorist attack. Is this the beginning of World War III? Those were, I remember, bang, 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 right back, back to back thoughts. And I'm thinking, okay, uh, uh, I'm the dad, I'm the husband, haven't really thought through an evacuation plan. What do you do in a situation like this? Um, my boss was demanding that I go to this, it was, the meeting was about two miles from my house, which was good, um, but uh, was demanding I go to this meeting, not really sure, so Bonnie and I have a little powwow, what do we do? She said, I'm going to monitor this, and I'm going to pack, I don't know what we need to do, we're going to be ready to go, and um, I said, it's going to be a short meeting, should I go or not? She said, you should go, but we're constantly texting back and forth, and um, then she said, hey, a plane flew into the Pentagon, a plane crashed out in a field, and then I was like, I got to go. You know, so I came home, and uh, uh, we were trying to figure out what to do. It was really scary, terrifying time. Over the months and years since, I found myself going back to that. I think that fundamentally changed the world, that event, and um, changed our country, changed us as people. Um, and so sometimes I find myself just drawn back to documentaries about it because it was maybe the most iconic moment, most significant moment in my lifetime. And um, I get drawn back into it. And there's a lot of weird stuff on the internet about all that, and I don't know what you think about it. And please don't send me emails proving your point. Um, <laughs> just not going to read them. Because uh, I'm trying to maximize my time and make the best of every opportunity, and life's too short. But, um, and I'm sorry, did I make you mad? I'm sorry. But I, I get pulled in sometimes to watch documentary, and um, maybe the most moving documentaries are the ones that are centered around the phone calls, because there were thousands, just in that first hour, 40-something thousand phone calls just from the two towers. Um, but there were thousands and thousands and thousands of phone calls from people who were starting to realize, I'm probably going to die. And this is really unique because in human history up to this point, because cell phones were fairly new in 2001, remember? Uh, so they weren't brand new. Everybody having them in their pocket was new. And, you know, only just a few years uh, that we'd had phones. Prior to that, the two experiences with death are a family member who's lingering for a while. And we have those moments where that family member, uh, you know, brings the family in and says the goodbyes and the I love yous and makes sure it's, you know, everything is buttoned up. Or there's the surprise, tragic moment, and that's it. And there were no goodbyes, and there wasn't even time to make a phone call. But in this situation, plane crashes, it was an over an hour before the buildings went down. And so people had, you know, the first several minutes, it was people were hoping they'd get help. And then after that, they start realizing help's not coming. And they start calling family members. They start calling friends. It's unbelievable to listen to the priorities of somebody who knows they only have a few minutes left calling their husband, calling their wife. A fighter pilot on a plane calls his wife, it doesn't look good, and I just need you to know I love you. We've had a great life. A wife calling her husband, and, and uh, he doesn't pick up. He was sleeping. And he heard the phone ring, but he didn't pick it up, so she calls her dad, and she's on the phone with her dad passing on 
messages. It's just, it's so powerful. In this moment with these people that are faced with death in just a few minutes, they're faced with eternity. We get this glimpse of what it's like to know that life is short. And when they're faced with eternity on 9-11, they called the people that they love. Not wanting to talk or argue one more time about the fact that he forgot to take out the garbage this morning. Or to complain that he had to go to dinner with his in-laws last night. That wasn't it. There were no phone calls about investment strategies or paying the bills. There wasn't any arguing about how to discipline the kids or complaining about politics or legislation. They just wanted to say, I love you. What if we always lived that way? What if we always lived knowing that this is a short life and we don't know what's happening tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. What if we just started realizing little things need to be done? I'm not saying little things aren't a big deal, but little things don't need to run our lives. They don't have to control our lives. We shouldn't invest all of our emotions in the little things. It's little things that tear marriages apart. It's little things that alienate parents from their kids. It's the little stuff. As I mentioned earlier, we all have this gravitational pull toward things that don't matter. It's just natural. We get pulled toward stuff and we're mad. How many people said the last thing? that we said to each other, I wish I could take back. This is why God's given us these warnings. He, God's given us these warnings not to scare us. He's not trying to scare us because he knows what's on the other side. For those that have trusted Christ, it's not scary. If you knew what he knew, you wouldn't be afraid at all. So he's not telling us these things to scare us. He's trying to help us. He's trying to help us start living with right priorities, that this life isn't very long, but it matters. And so how do I maximize this life as an investment for the next life. So Paul tells us, and he references fire here, and this fire is not hell, and this fire is not purgatory. It's a metaphor. He's saying here, but on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. If you read this whole passage, I just pulled that verse out. If you read the whole passage, he's saying that some of the things we do with our lives, we build with valuable resources, gold, diamonds. Those things are going to last. Other things we build with our life, we're building with wood and with hay, and those things won't last. So when, he, when God really puts the heat on, and it's not talking about hell, it's not talking about actual fire. What he's talking about is when he really tests how we lived our life. Some stuff that seemed so important, you're just going to burn up. It's not even going to last. But other stuff really matters. And those are the things that have eternal consequences. Circle the word survives. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. Is what I'm focusing my life on going to last beyond my last breath? Is what I'm focusing my life on going to last beyond my kids blowing their inheritance? Is, is, my, is what I'm focusing my life on going to live beyond the little plaque on the little league field? Is what I'm focusing my life on going to last for eternity? The best investment you can make is to invest in those things that will last for eternity. What lasts for eternity? Human souls do. People do. The best thing you can do with your life is to live your life trying to get as many people away from hell and into heaven as possible. Every Mom and dad, you have the answer, you have the antidote to your children's eternity. Brothers and sisters, you have the antidote to your relatives' eternity. Coworkers, you have the antidote to your coworkers' eternity. The best investment you can make for eternity is to take someone with you. Number four, we'll finish up with this. I need to go through life looking up and not around. I need to go through life looking up and not around, having an eternal perspective, having a bigger picture, understanding that this is just temporary. Thank God for it. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. Every good thing is just a little glimpse of the perfection of heaven. But this isn't home. Have you ever been on a, on a trip and uh, you stop off at the rest stop and you go up and you, I'm waiting, you know, for uh, the uh, people in my family that take a lot longer. And so I'm standing there in front of that map, right? And I'm tracking and we've gone like two hours and there's always a little arrow, you are here. And at the beginning you're like, oh, we're never going to get there, right? Just horrible. But then one or two rest stops later, next thing you know, it's not very far. You know, when, when I'm looking at that arrow, you are here. 
Uh, it doesn't say you've arrived. I'm not looking, okay, where can we put up a tent? How can we stay here? I, I'm looking at going, I'm right there, and I'm only this far away. Not very far at all. Woo, it's getting close. And you get excited. You get more enthusiastic with the anticipation of what's coming. We stop looking at what's around us at the rest area. We start looking at what's coming, the beach in Key West, right? The resort, the, the eternity. That's what we're looking at. So in Hebrews chapter 11, there's this like hall of fame. It's hall of faith. It's all, it's all these famous people that are followers of God that God is celebrating. And at the end of the chapter, it says, and the world is not worthy of people like this. And then it's challenging us to be people of faith as well. One of the people mentioned there is Moses. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I need to really highlight this. So Moses was born into slavery. He was a Jewish kid. The Jews were slaves to the Egyptians. And uh, he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. So this is really significant that he went and he looked around and he went, I'm not going to live like an Egyptian as he began to grow up and be aware of himself. So not only did he live in the palace, in the most powerful empire on the planet at the time, he also lived in a family that were gods. The pharaohs were gods. Their family were gods. This wasn't just Moses waking up someday and looking in his stepdad's check account, you know, Bezos' uh, check account or, or Gates' uh, bank account and going, yeah, I'm not interested in $100 billion, I'm out. He looked at the fact that they had unlimited wealth and he would have been worshipped as a god. And he went, this is wrong. I'm not going to go this way. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures. This is important. A circle that fleeting pleasures there. What he realized is it wasn't going to last. So he could put on a show. He could be fake. He could pursue things that just weren't going to last, but they weren't going to last. They were fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his great reward. Epididomi. I'll pay you back. And so this life was short, that life forever. What he did in this life mattered in that life. He was looking ahead. So he's willing to set aside what didn't matter here so he could spend time on what does matter there. Looking ahead literally transformed Moses' life. It changed his perspective, and because his worldview changed, his priorities changed, and he began looking ahead, and looking ahead will change your life too. He chose not to get distracted from what matters most by looking around at all that Egypt had to offer. And Jesus just tells us this. Don't store up treasures here on earth where the moths eat them and the rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, their desires of your heart will be also. A lot of people aren't enthusiastic about eternity because all their treasures are here. But man, if we start sending people ahead of us, we start leading as many people to Jesus as possible, we have more going with us than staying. Our heart changes, our focus changes, our priorities begin to change. So yes, we're just passing through. This is just a rest stop on the way to the destination. And life is really short. We barely have enough time to get it right. So we've got to make the most of every opportunity, thinking about our life in the same way that those 9-11 people were thinking. Stop focusing on the gravitational pull of those things that don't matter. Instead, in every area, with your finances, with your family, with faith, make the most of every opportunity. And we've got to look up, not just around. Billy Graham started off in that video at the beginning. Jesus, he was just quoting Jesus, Matthew chapter 16. He says, Jesus said, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? What he's talking about is life. Is anything worth more than life? Because this life, life never ends. Your body dies, but life never ends. Can I pray with you? Jesus, thank you for giving us these ideas, giving us these reminders to live our life in a way that matters. Not so we can get into heaven. You're the one who solved that issue. But so that we can make a, light, a, a, a difference with our life and that we can take treasures to heaven with us, those people around us that don't yet know you. 
So help us to live with an eternal perspective. We're grateful for all the amazing things. We enjoy the amazing things you've given us. But help us not to get so distracted we think this is home when we're just at a rest stop. We look forward to all the glories and the blessings of heaven, but between here and there, we promise to do everything we know to do to bring as many people to heaven with us as possible. For those of you in the room, you say, you know what, Jeff, I'm that person Jesus is talking about. Gain the whole world, lose your own soul. I don't want that. What do I do? The Bible says we're all sinners, but God loves sinners. Jesus paid the price. So if we will invite him to be the boss of our life and we'll surrender to him, he'll forgive our sins and give us confidence in eternity. He'll solve this thing for us. It's just by faith. Maybe you pray a prayer like this. Maybe you say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I live my life my own way. But I believe that Jesus died and rose again so that my sins could be forgiven, so I could have confidence in eternity, knowing that you solved it, so I can have power for living today. Jesus, today's my day. I open my life to you. Help me to be everything that you made me to be. Help me to live my life for you with an eye on eternity for the rest of my days. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.